Well, good morning. My name is Todd Malone. It is a privilege to be with you here this morning. Uh, as you probably guessed, we are hitting the pause button on our Ephesians series. We will come back to that and finish that up, but we want to take a few weeks to um, prepare ourselves for Christmas. And we're going to start with a group participation question. What comes to your mind when you think about celebrating the Christmas season? What? Grandchildren. Outstanding. Yes, we have seven of them in town right now. So, uh, yeah, fantastic. What else? Food? I need some more confident answers. Family, Jesus, the birth of Jesus. Yeah, what else? Christmas cookies. Um, and when are you bringing them over? Okay, outstanding. Um, what's that? Yeah, certain family members that are really close to us. The smell of a Christmas tree. And for those of us who grew up in Oregon, you betcha. Um, oh, yeah, apple pie. Yeah, abs yeah, we can just close in prayer right there. Um, absolutely. So um, for you, when does the celebration of Christmas start? After Thanksgiving? When it's over, <laughs> when the grandkids go home, yeah, there are um, there are certain universal rules about the celebration of Christmas. Um, you don't buy another family a puppy without getting their permission first. Um, <laughs> you don't start Christmas music until. After Thanksgiving, right? You um, stores don't put out Christmas decorations until after Easter. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure that anyone actually follows those rules. And it turns out there are absolutely no rules whatsoever for a Christmas sermon series. Um, Advent is something that's been celebrated by Christians for centuries. And it officially starts so that you have four Advent Sundays before Christmas Day, which means that Advent starts next week, except for at FBC. Uh, we're going to start it this week. And the reason we're doing that is because we are going to be involved in Advent conspiracy, and I wanted to give us a little bit extra time for us to enjoy that. Advent Conspiracy is something I'll talk in more detail about now, but um, you might have received a flavor for it when you walked in. If you noticed the desk over here to my left, there's a whole bunch of stuff on that desk and pictures of children. And that's because what we're going to do this Advent season is we're going to support the families and the children who are involved in foster care, adoption, we are going to love on the orphans and those who take care of them. And we're going to take care of those people who are right here in our community. Uh, if you stop by that desk, there are sign-up sheets for how you can get involved in different organizations. Uh, there is a weighted blanket ministry that involves sewing. So if you like to sew, there's something for you to do there. Love Them More, Legacy Closet, Beds of Hope, Hannah House. These are all ministries that are involved in caring for families and children who are either a part of the foster system or adoption system or, um, in some cases, unwed young mothers. And we want to love those folks well. So I want to encourage you to stop by there, and I'll encourage you again at the end and each week, you're going to hear a little bit more about some of those organizations and what they're doing and how we can support them. And honestly, my heart 
is that we would not just support them and be involved with them during Advent. My heart is that some of you will connect with those organizations for the first time and say, I love the opportunity of making God's love tangible in the lives of these families and children, and it will be something that becomes a part of your year around. Um, we are going to do Advent candles and readings and all that, but we're going to join the rest of the Christian world and start that next week. Um, but I just wanted to give us a little bit of time to get involved in Advent conspiracy. Now, um, I will say that Advent conspiracy, if you have done this before at another church, a lot of times it's tied to providing water, fresh water, for people around the world. And that's because the church that started this 10 years ago in Houston started this because they did some mathematical calculations. It takes, it would take, $10 billion to permanently, permanently provide fresh water to every person on the, on the planet. $10 billion. You know how much the U.S. spends on Christmas every year? This is 10 years ago stats. $450 billion. And this church said to itself, if in one year people redirected 2% of their giving, or their Christmas spending, and gave it towards providing fresh water, in one year we could permanently solve that crisis around the world. Uh, and that has been what they have taken up. And other churches have taken up uh, the idea of Advent conspiracy, and many churches like us are also starting to say, what can we do locally to think about where our priorities are and how we use our resources over the Christmas season. And we're going to look at, as goes with Advent Conspiracy, four different concepts over the course of this series. We're going to look this morning at worshiping fully. We're going to look at spending less, giving more, and then loving all. And like I said, this morning we're going to start with worshiping fully. So let me take you back to the very first question I asked, and let me change it a little bit. What comes to your mind when you think about worshiping during the Christmas season? Apple pie, of course, yeah. Christmas carols, yeah, good. What else? Hallmark? I just don't even know where to go with that. What else? Candlelight service, yeah, Christmas Eve service. What else? All the songs. Kids Christmas program. By the way, can I just stop and make a statement here? Was this amazing or what? Um, something that I have said, many people have said for years and years and years, is that our children and our youth are the future of the church. And that is true, but it is a truth that hides another truth that is extremely important. Our children and youth are the present of this church as well. And they are a part of our body, and we just had children and youth minister to us powerfully. And um, we can't lose sight of the fact that they are every bit as much a part of the life of this church as anyone else. They don't have to wait to be a part of it. Um, okay, that was my soapbox. I got to get back on track now. Um, it's interesting how things change when you change your terminology from celebrating the Christmas season to worship at the Christmas season. Right? Those are two different concepts. Many people will celebrate a cowboy's victory. No one outside of Texas will worship the cowboys. I was going to say we shouldn't worship the cowboys, but I just, that's probably going to fall on deaf ears here. Um, right? There's a huge difference. We celebrate the cowboys. Because we enjoy them. They're important to us. We're excited about them, except in our house, we're Packers fans. But, um, 
but our life is not centered around the cowboys. We do not make decisions about how we will spend our time and our money and resources. They are not the most important thing in defining who we are. That is reserved for what we worship. And I would like to suggest this morning that celebrating Christmas is fantastic. But Christmas is an opportunity to do far more than celebrate. It is an opportunity to worship. And that's what Psalm 145 is all about. And I think we're going to see that it has a great deal to tell us about how we worship at Christmas. Let me just give you an interesting piece of information about Psalm 145. Psalm 145 is an acrostic. And what that means is each line starts with a different letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And then the next line starts with the next letter. Then the third line starts with Gimel, and then so forth, right through the alphabet. So it's a very carefully thought through psalm. This is, some, this is something that David really gave a lot of, of effort to and thought to and how to construct this psalm. And the imagery, imagery that is in this psalm is just brilliantly laid out. And what we're going to do is look at how this psalm is laid out and how it brings out some of the major themes in this psalm, and we're going to connect that with our worship at Christmas. Now, reading a psalm is not like reading the book of Ephesians. They're very different sorts of literature, right? A psalm is a work of poetry. It's a song. It's something that is, uses imagery, not logical argument. Words are repeated for emphasis. There are similar or contrasting ideas that are set next to one another to make a point artistically. And David communicates to us through how he puts this psalm together some things we are to know about who God is and how we relate to him. So to understand this psalm, we need to start by understanding how it is structured. And really, you can divide this psalm into four parts. And the first part is in verses 1 through 3, and here David declares his intent to worship. David calls God, my God and my king. And in saying this, he is emphasizing that God is both his authority, but God is also personal. And he says that he is going to extol God. He is going to praise God. He is going to... One I'm missing. Bless. There we go. All of these terms are terms for worship. It's all speaking out to God and others about who God is and what he is doing and what he has done. And David says he is going to do this forever and ever. It's going to be what consumes his life. So in the first three verses, what David does is he declares he is going to worship God. And in the rest of the psalm, he tells us why. And the first reason has to do with God's works. And it's interesting, as it goes very well with what happened this morning, one generation shall commend your works to another. Now, obviously, the first thing that we think of is one generation passing to the next generation the truth of who God is and the truth of how God is at work. But do you notice it's saying more than that? One generation is going to declare his works to another. It's not just the older generation speaking to the younger generation. It's what happened this morning. The younger generation is going to speak to the older generation. And we are going to tell one another about what God is doing. In verse 5, David makes it very personal. He says that he will meditate on God's wondrous works. So where it's, it's in verse 4, it's people speaking publicly to one another. In verse 5, it's now David saying, I'm going to sit and personally take time to think hard about what God is doing, what he's up to in my life, what he's up to in the world. In verse 6, it goes back to the generations talking to each other. And then verses 7 and 8, you have God's works revealing his character. 
And then he closes, it says in verse 9, that God's goodness extends to all. His mercy is over everything that he has made. You see, David is, take, is, is creating this picture of taking time to think about what God is up to. He's creating a picture of people telling one another, this is how God is at work in my life. This is how God is at work in your life. This is how God is at work in the world around us. And you see what the assumption is underneath this passage. The assumption is that God is at work right now in David's life. That God is up to something in his life, and there is something that he has to tell others about, and there's something that he has to meditate on because God is at work. And I want to declare to you that the same God who is at work in David's life is at work in us right now. And the problem is, we often don't pay attention to what God is doing. But that's the assumption of this song is that God is at work right now in David's life in a way that can be seen, in a way that can be talked about. And God is at work in your life, in my life, in ways that can be seen and ways that can be talked about. The first reason David gives to worship is because of God's work. And then he broadens it to God's splendor in verses 10 through 13. And this shows that we should worship God not just for what he does, but for his character. And it looks like, and it's shown us here what it looks like to be under God's rule. Anytime you hear about the kingdom of God, one of the things that should come to your mind is not just the future, although that is true, but it's also what does it mean to live under God's rule? And what David says is life under God's rule is something that is described by glory and glorious splendor. These are the key descriptions, and these are words that are hard to capture. What does that mean? What is he talking about as glorious scripture, glorious splendor? And the way that I think about it, it is something that is so majestic, it has weight. This is a picture of Mount Shasta in Northern California. I am miles away when I took that picture. Miles and miles away. Where I grew up is over 100 miles away, and you can see that mountain as clear as day. When you stand even miles away from that mountain, that mountain is majestic. It is so big. It is so massive. It can take your breath away. Its presence just dominates you. It makes you feel small, but at the same time, you feel like you're just caught up right into this incredible majesty. And that's the type of picture that David is trying to give us here. The world under the rule and power of God where his mighty deeds are regularly seen as a world that is breathtaking. And when you pay attention to how God is at work around you and in you, the only way to describe it is glorious splendor. There is nothing more glorious that we have to look forward to than the future of every person being in right relationship with God without the effects of sin where God's will is done perfectly and completely, and nothing and no one around us is tainted by rebellion against God. And there is a name for that place. It's called heaven. But we live now anticipating and desiring and placing ourselves under the rule of God that we might experience life in his kingdom. The last and longest section is verses 14 through 21. And here David challenges us to worship God because he is present. Verses 14 through 16 show God present to those who are impressed, to those who are in need. God supplies their need and he uses words like falling and bow down. These are people who need the very basics of life. And God provides, he is near to them. He goes on in verses 
uh, 17 through 20 to talk about God being near to his people. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and all his works. He is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Of those who fear him, he hears their cry and he saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him. God is near to his people. He provides for them. He protects them. He saves them. And David ends the psalm basically where he started, but with a twist. My mouth will seek the praise of the Lord. But you see what he adds? But all flesh bless his holy name. David starts the psalm by saying, I will extol the Lord. I will bless the Lord. I will praise the Lord. And David ends the psalm by saying, look, you have seen the works of God. You have seen the splendor of God. You know that this God is present with you. Don't join me. Join me in praising God, all of creation, all people. Let everyone join me in praising God. That's how this psalm is structured. And I hope that what you see in this psalm is that David is unfolding a story. God is worthy of worship. Why? Because his deeds are wondrous and good. And that makes his rule majestic. We know that living under his rule is a wondrous and good thing. And he is near to us as our savior, as the one who provides and the one who protects. And so how do we end? Again, God is worthy of worship, not just my worship, but all of our worship. God is near. God's rule is majestic. God's works are wonderful. The assumption behind Psalm 145 is that God is at work right now. David is responding to what God is doing in his life and in the world around him. And the same God that is working in David's life is at, work, is at work in your life as well. And how he is at work comes out in the two major themes that we see in Psalm 145. God's greatness and God's goodness. Now, if you're keeping score online, um, I'm sorry about this, but I actually changed the order Online, it says God's goodness and then God's greatness. I flipped it around. There's a reason for that, but we won't go into it. Um, so I apologize in advance if I'm messing you up. But the theme of God's greatness is introduced actually in verse 3. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. That means we can never fully know it. Even though he talks about it and David's going to go on through the rest of the psalm and describe it. He's saying even our best efforts to describe God's greatness will not be adequate. And then he goes to the psalm and he connects what God does with his might, his power, the, the, the incredible majesty of who our God is. And so David says in verse four that God's acts are mighty. His works are wondrous in verse five. The might of his deeds, they are, they are awesome. He then says in verses 11 through 13, he talks about God's kingdom. God's kingdom is described in terms of power. See, this is a picture of God who is not limited by time or opposition. God's kingdom endures through all generations. Nothing will keep God from achieving his plans. This is a God that when you see his works, you are astonished by what he is capable of. And there is nothing that will ever change that. Have you seen that in your life? Have you seen God's works in your life in ways that astonish you? In the last week, I have seen God's work in my life and in the lives of others in ways that are astonishing. I have seen people who have been divided for decades come together in unity. That is the awesome, mighty, powerful work of God. I have seen people who are fundamentally shy even timid people 
go to someone who hurt them and say, what you have done has hurt me, but I love you and I want to be in relationship. Can we talk about this? That is the awesome power of the mighty God at work. I have seen forgiveness where there is deep hurt. I have seen honesty at great risk. These are some of the most wondrous and mightiest and awesome acts that God ever performs. And he is performing them all around us all of the time. And he is performing them in us, each of us, all of the time. God is a great God. The second theme is God's goodness. It's the idea that God's majesty and power is used for what is right. It's used for our well-being. God's greatness speaks of what he does. God's goodness speaks of who he is, his character. And verse 7 says that God's goodness is abundant. It's overflowing. And then he goes on to describe what does it mean when we say that God is good. When we say that God is good, what we mean is that he is righteous. What we mean is that he is gracious and merciful. What we mean is that he is slow to anger. He's patient with us. What we mean is that he is abounding in steadfast love. His love absolutely overflows. That's what we mean when we say the Lord is good. And notice that he is good to all. God is not about just being random in who he picks. He is not about just being capricious. God is good to all. His mercy is over everything, everywhere, all of the time. We are never outside of God's mercy and God's goodness. To say that God is good is to say that God is faithful As we sang this morning, great is thy faithfulness. To say that God is good is to say that God cares for the needy. He upholds them. He raises up those who are are bowed down. To say that God is good is to say that he is our protector. He preserves us. He hears our cry and he saves To say that God is good is to say that God always, at all times, is working for our well-being. David gives us a picture of God's goodness, meaning that God is constantly, unfailing, working working for our well-being. There is not one moment in your life when you are outside of God's desire for your good. God is always on the side of what is right and just and good. And even when we are not... God is patient and merciful and gracious with us. God is not distant. He is at work in your life with a purpose. He is providing. He is protecting. This is how the psalm is structured. Four parts, two major themes. Have you um, you ever stood with someone and looked at a rainbow? You ever stood with someone, looked at a rainbow and said, that rainbow, that's amazing. And then have that person say, yeah, that's really interesting how light refracts through uh, water drops. And you stand there and you think to yourself, that's a true statement. but you kind of missed it. If we stop our study of the psalm right here, we will be guilty of looking at a rainbow and saying, isn't it interesting how light is refracted through water drops? The purpose of this psalm As important as its structure and theme is, the purpose of this psalm is to call us to worship God. It is to give us words. It is to help us articulate what is it that we are seeing about God if we will pay attention. And what words do we use to give expression of that back to God and to others? 
The point is to understand what God is doing and then reflect on it and on his character and respond in worship. This psalm is an invitation to reflect on how you have seen God at work and what this tells you about his character and then declare it back to God and to others. And that is what takes us to Christmas. The first Christmas, that moment when Jesus was born, was the greatest, most significant moment in human history where the goodness and greatness of God came near. The actual physical presence of God's goodness and greatness was born in a stable and laid in a manger. He was worshiped by shepherds and later by wise men. And if you wanted to know what the greatness of God at work for your well-being looks like, you look at Jesus on earth. The reason Christmas matters is because that is when the goodness and greatness of God came near like it never has before. Christmas calls for more than celebration. Christmas calls for worship. The Christmas season is meant to be a time when we live out Psalm 145. It's a time for us to think deeply about how God's goodness and greatness were displayed by Jesus, the Son of God, being born into our world. And Psalm 145 is a great way to focus our thinking, our prayers, and our worship this Christmas. And I want to challenge you to challenge yourself and your family to think about God's goodness and greatness, not just on December 25th but through the entire Christmas season. And we can do that as, as we put out decorations. We can ask ourselves, how do putting out these decorations remind us of God's goodness? How do they remind us of God's greatness? And we can take the time to think about and talk about them with our children, with our families, with one another. And we take something that is a wonderful tradition and we turn it into an act of worship. When you sing a song like Silent Night, what is it telling you about God's goodness and God's greatness? And as you think about that, and you think about that song in those terms, it turns it from just an act of celebration into an act of worship. I'm not sure that I can give you much help with Rudolph or Frosty the Snowman, but things like Silent Night, those are good. When you give and receive gifts... Think about how it is a picture of God's goodness and God's greatness. And then turn something that can be easily self-focused into an act of worship. As part of that reflection, FBC is going to encourage you to make verses 14 and 15 very real. What is God doing in the world he is upholding all who are falling. He's raising up all who are bowed down. There are people in this world for whom the very basic necessities of life are at risk. And God is in the business of providing for those necessities. And we want to be a part of how God's goodness and greatness is at work around us this Advent season. And that's why we're doing Advent Conspiracy. We've already started that, really. We started that with the South Ward Project. And if you've been in our church, something that we've done every year for the last several years. And if you are new to our church, the reason we do it is because the principal of that school um, told us one day that there are an astonishing number of those students who live in cars. And Christmas is a bad day for them. And it's a bad day for them because they will receive absolutely nothing. And even though we don't want to make Christmas about the giving of gifts, there's something else that gets communicated to a child when they are left out. And that is that they don't matter. 
And that is important to us, to send the message that yes, they do. We've already talked about the display that's in our lobby for Advent Conspiracy. Again, I would encourage you, as you stop by the South Ward trees, purchase an ornament, hang it on the tree, then head over to that other desk and pick up information or sign up for information about how you can be involved in one of these organizations that's providing for children and families who are in need. And we also want to think about how we support you as families in making Advent and Advent Conspiracy a part of your entire family celebration, entire family worship throughout the Christmas season. And at the Community Life Desk, which is to my right, we have some family study guides that we'd encourage you to pick up as well. Stop by there and they will give you ideas, reflections, things that you can look at and study to help you focus on God's goodness and greatness and how we can reflect that to those who are needy this Christmas. Psalm 145 is a song of worship. It invites us to worship God for his goodness and his greatness. It invites, it invites us to worship God because he is near. And that is exactly David's point in this psalm. We worship because God's goodness and greatness came near. And that is exactly the point of Christmas. God's goodness and, grace and greatness came near. I love to celebrate Christmas but I want to do more this year. I want to worship this entire Christmas season. I want to make God's greatness and goodness known to my friends, to my family, and to people I may never know, but who are in desperate need. I want to worship God by joining his work in drawing near to those who are in need. What are some other ways that we can respond to this message? I'd encourage you to go back through Psalm 145. Take a look at what does it say about what God does and who God is? How do you see these same themes played out in the Christmas story, in the story of Jesus' birth, ultimately his life on earth and his death for us and his resurrection three days later? Spend time in prayer Dedicate time in prayer this Christmas season, even this week. God, you have shown your goodness and your greatness to me. And say back to him how he has done so. And then tell that to other people. Make talking about God's goodness and greatness in your life a part of your Christmas. With your family, with your friends, with one another. Not just on December 25th, but all through the Christmas season. And then as we've said before we have very tangible ways that you can be involved in loving people well who are in desperate need of God's goodness and gracious and greatness. If you're someone here and you are just starting on your journey or just curious about who is God, and you're sitting here and you're listening to stories of God's goodness and greatness, and you're saying, I want to know that God, well, then we want to introduce you to him. And you're going to have people who are standing up here to pray or talk to you at the end of the service. And I would encourage you to come, let us introduce you to the good and great God who has drawn near. If you're someone who's, who's a new Christian and you're wanting to grow, then you may listen to a message like this and say, how do I know how to live as if God is near? Again, a really good next step is to talk to one of these folks who are up here or talk to someone around you who you know who's been a Christian longer and help them pour into your life in that way. And if you're someone who's been a Christian for a long time and you've walked with God for a long time, then your job is to take this psalm and make it real to other people around you. Give words to them for God's goodness and greatness and the fact that this God has come near. And we want to close with a prayer of thanksgiving and worship for the goodness and greatness of our God that has drawn near. And so I'm going to invite our prayer team to come forward. And I'm going to invite all of us to stand. Again, these folks who are coming forward, these are people who are here to pray with you no matter what you're experiencing in life. They want to love you and encourage you well. 
But boy, we certainly want to introduce you or help you get to know better the good and great God who has drawn near. Join with me in praying and thanking God for his goodness and his greatness in our lives. Heavenly Father, that is exactly what we do. We come together as a body, as your people, and we are astounded that the creator and sustainer of the universe with all your majestic power, with all of the incredible deeds that you do and can do, with our smallness and with our failings, Lord, you are still good to us. Your mercy knows no boundary. Your love, your grace, they overflow abundantly. And Lord, there has never been a greater picture of that being brought near and close to us than when you sent your son to be born in a stable. Lord, this season, we will have a lot to celebrate. But we ask you, Lord, to help us to not just stop there. Help us to worship you to center our lives around you, to center our priorities around you, to think deeply about what you are doing and who you are that we might participate. We thank you for the privilege of that. In Jesus' precious name, amen. So let me leave you with this thought. Here's what we've said about God today. We have said that our God is good and he is great And he is near to you. So your challenge is to make this Christmas season more than a celebration. Leave here and make this Christmas season a time of worship. You are dismissed.